Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you begin to love what you are listening to, please take a moment and hit that subscribe button and make sure that notification bell is set to all so you don't miss every time I upload, which tends to be daily. If you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me with a cup of coffee, that information can be found down in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Esoteric Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before the first story gets read, I'll put an ad, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I remember going camping with my parents every year in the summer. We would make a huge deal of it with the whole family and everyone around. It was always a full week right around the 4th of July. At the end of the camping trip, my dad would call the camping office and rent the same space. We might as well have owned it. Our camping neighbors were usually decent. There would always be different people at the other spots because we were the only ones in that area who would grab the same place for the next year, a year early. There were always fun kids to play with or noisy, obnoxious adults who got along great with my parents. We were always the center of attention, too. My dad loved telling campfire stories and scaring the living hell out of other people. He'd always supply beer on campfire nights, too. I think people started to rent the other spaces early because he was suddenly becoming the talk of the campsite. One year, though, we didn't get the best neighbors. These people came and they were always sleeping during the day and partying all night long. They were really loud with motorcycles and music. Their friends came and went all night long. I think that was the first night I ever smelled pot too. I'm sure they were doing other things as well because now, when I look back on it, the odd behavior from some of these people wasn't like pot at all. It was far worse. The week was almost over and their friends stopped showing up. All that was left was this woman who was always passed out and this guy who must have been her husband or boyfriend. The whole week, I never got a good look at him, but that night, someone walked into our area and started snooping around. I peeked outside my tent and could only see from the waist down. He was wearing jeans and motorcycle boots. He also had a big knife hanging from his belt like the guy did at the other campsite. I was sure it was him. I pretended to be asleep, figuring he would just go away until I heard my tent unzip. Standing there, looking down on me, was this huge man with long black wavy hair and a gray beard. He didn't have a shirt on, but I could barely make out the tattoos up and down his arms, except for the big crow on the back of his hand. He leaned over to me. It was then I noticed he had no eyes. Or maybe he did, but the sockets were all black. I could see what might be the whites of his eyes glisten in the light. But they were only pools of darkness. He grinned and his rotten black teeth smelled of death and decay. As he reached his large oil-stained hand down to my neck... I heard a gross, crushing sound, almost like a wet towel falling onto concrete. Blood squirted from the back of his head to all over the inside of my tent doorway. I thought it might be the guy from the next campsite and maybe my dad shot him, but 
Then the guy from the other campsite grabbed the intruder's legs and pulled him away, leaving a thick trail of blood from the guy's head in the dirt. I was too scared to move or cry out for my dad. I stayed in my tent for the rest of the night, curled up in my sleeping bag. Somehow, I finally fell asleep. I awoke the next morning, and it had been raining the night before. There wasn't any blood inside my tent, and the trail of blood was washed away. Dad was grumbling, saying something about the rest of the week raining, and that we we're just going to go home. I wanted to say something to him, but since there was no blood, maybe it was a nightmare I had that night. I don't know. That is what I figured until I saw the guy cleaning up his campsite next door. As he hoisted a large black bag on the back of his truck, an arm dangled from the opening. It had a tattoo of a huge crow on the back of his hand. The crying in the woods started back in the 1990s. We lived in a housing development that was surrounded by woods. The community had a pool and a playground, so we didn't really need to go exploring. But you know how kids are. We would go out into the woods to see what was there while our parents were working in the next town over. Most of the time, the group of us would find dead animals or trails to cool little streams. What was weird is that nothing ever seemed to be in the same place twice. We would always try to find the stream or clearing that we had made the day before, but we would never find the same one. It was always different. One day when we ventured out, I could hear a baby crying. At first, my friends couldn't hear it, but I could. I told them to follow me, and as the sound got stronger, they still could not hear it. We walked around what seemed in circles until we were so tired that we had to stop. It was then that my friends started to hear it too. It was getting louder and louder until the sound was so unbearable that we all started covering our ears and screaming. My friend Kathy started rolling on the ground, crying and yelling, Make it stop! Bob was biting his nails, a habit he had, stopped through counseling. He was biting so low that his fingertips began to bleed. When I pulled him away from his fingers, he got really mad and tried to punch me. Rick curled up into a ball like a baby and started sucking his thumb. Finally, Jez started screaming, shut up, over and over again. Her face was red, and I swear that she was going to pass out as she screamed. She began hitting herself in the face. I plugged my ears and watched my friends go insane for about five minutes. And then suddenly, it all stopped. My friends stopped hurting themselves, and we all looked at each other. Kathy had cuts and bruises from the sticks and rocks on the ground. Bob's fingers were very bloody. Rick practically sucked the skin off of his thumb until it bled. The worst off? Jez. She actually hit herself in the face and was black and blue. We went straight to our houses and never spoke about it again. Our parents simply thought we were either back to our old habits or got into fights. With the stories we told, they thought we were making it all up and some of us were grounded. I was glad because I never wanted to go back into those woods ever again. There was an urban legend in my small town of a guy who would abduct kids in the woods and eat them. It all started because our area has a huge amount of missing kids. 
As the town grew bigger, the stories got bigger, and people stopped camping in the woods. The cops think it might be child trafficking because one of the closest cities has a big problem with teens who run away and get caught up in drugs and prostitution. It's really a really sad story, but most of the runaways are found either dead from drugs or eventually they got arrested. It's the missing kids. No one could ever figure out what happened to them. We went camping one summer near the area where the urban legend happened. Since the rumors of trafficking were really true, but it was all runaways mostly and kids getting abducted, the people started camping out in the woods again. People were no longer afraid of getting taken or their kids getting stolen. For a long time, I was really nice until one day I noticed this gruff old guy going through the trees. It was the end of September and the trees were losing their leaves, but still thick enough to not be able to see straight into the forest. I had to go to the bathroom, so with my roll of TP, I found the right tree secluded from everyone else. And right when I started to squat, I saw this old man who looked like he hadn't shaved or taken a bath since the 70s. I mean, at first, I really thought I had a real Bigfoot sighting, until I realized it was a another human just staring at me. I yanked up my pants so fast and started to run back to camp, when I tripped over a tree root sticking up in the ground. I got the wind knocked out of me so bad that it took me a moment to even stand up again, and he was almost on me. I ran again, not even turning around to see if he was behind me, and I made it to camp screaming. At first, no one believed me until someone saw the muddy handprints on my back. I didn't even realize he had touched me at one point, but when I changed my shirt, I realized that he was so close at one point that he could have grabbed me at any time. My skin crawled. Someone called the police that night, and everyone went hunting for this guy in the woods. There were no traces of him at all until one of the cops found an old abandoned rock mining cave. They went in really deep and found a bunch of clothes and stuffed animals. Hiding under all those clothes, they found the bones of children. To this day, none of them have been identified. So, we were abducted by aliens while camping. My friends and family have been camping together since I was six years old. I am now in my 30s. Every year, we are drawn to the same place and have never gone to any other campground. We never really understood why until recently, when I started having these horrible dreams about being kidnapped by people I didn't know. When the dream started, I couldn't remember all of the details. I woke up drenched in the middle of the night, only to remember that I was in a lot of pain in my dream, but I didn't remember the dream. My husband was sound asleep and no amount of screaming I did woke him up. I started talking about the dreams during our campfire stories and suddenly other people in the group realized they were having the same dreams. As we kept on telling each other what had happened, the stories became more clear in our minds we all had similar experiences. After telling campfire stories and drinking a bed of beer or root beer, we'd all go to bed and pass out. Then, a feeling of lightness overcame my body with a buzzing sound in my brain. It was like an electrical sound hovering over us. Then, we all described the same bright light and something pulling us towards it. It literally was picking us up out of our beds and up through our tents. It was as if 
anything that was between us and that light didn't matter. We would pass right through it. Then we would end up on a table in an operating room where these creatures that we later learned were named Zeta Reticuland by people with the same stories would operate on us. They had these huge black almond-shaped eyes and gray bodies. They seemed to wear no clothes, although we couldn't decide if they had suits that matched their bodies or not. One guy in our group thought they did. We remember the different experiments they would do. One of our friends even described his eyeball being scooped out of his head and put in right back. He now gets migraines on that side of his head constantly. One even talked about a laser probe they put into his brain from the back of his head. He has a perfectly round spot of gray hair in his gorgeous dark hair. You can't see it unless he shaves his head. Another gal thought that they had taken their eggs from her ovaries in the most violent and invasive way. Some of us agreed with the stories and others had more. Up until that night, there were about 33 of us who went camping every year in a huge group and the number kept growing until we all shared our stories. Now, we only discuss what has happened to us online. After we stopped camping together, none of us got a reprieve, but others were still subjected to the horrors of these creatures. I know one small group took off and became nomads. We only find each other online. We're all terrified of the woods and, of course, these alien things that abused us. No one talks about it outside the group until now. I hope they don't find me, but it had to be said. I used to write horror stories, a lot of horror stories. They were okay, probably not Stephen King quality, but they were a lot of fun. My friends loved them, and so did my family. I kept on writing them for fun and free on one of those Reddit subcategories. I don't want to name which one because I don't want to be found. Reddit was fun. There's a lot of good people there, and this has nothing really to do with them at all. It has everything to do with the strangeness that happened to me. I decided to go out to our family's cabin in the woods. I know, how cliche, but it's true. We have a very small cabin that is really only big enough to store food and supplies while we slept outside. I brought my truck and slept in the back with my laptop riding the night away. There was no electricity, so I did have a small solar power charger that kept my machine running during part of the night, while I charged it during the day. About halfway through the week, I got this overwhelming feeling of being watched. I thought it might be a wolf or a bear, so I made a few warning shots with my shotgun. Later on, I still felt eyes upon me. I was using the internet, tethering from my cell phone to upload my stories and check my mail when I got this message in my IM. Hello, Randy. Uh, who is this? I typed back. Julie, the person replied. We went back and forth about how she knew me and it was from one of my stories that I had posted. It was really weird because nowhere did I put my real name in any of the stories. We kept on chatting while I am trying to figure out who in the world this person was. I don't know her from high school, college, or even work. None of the parties I went to, nor any social media. She was just Julie and I. Had no clue at all. She told me about all of the things I loved 
that were similar to what she loved. She told me about how she loved my style and even how I designed the inside of my house, giving very creepy details of my unique design. She even told me that she loved my new haircut. At that point, I had it. I couldn't take the suspense any longer. This woman knew so much about me, and I had no clue who she was. Maybe I was drunk and the conversation wasn't happening. Maybe I was dreaming. I rebooted my machine to fill some reality of the moment. But the conversation was still there when I opened the messenger window in my browser. I'm still here, silly. You can't get rid of me that easily, even though you tried, she typed. I could almost hear her say it in my brain. Who are you? I can't believe you don't remember. This time, I heard the incredibly sexy voice from the woods. I looked around the trees from where I sat in the back of my truck and then saw her. The shadow of a woman I once created on the computer. She wore the same silky dress and heels that I killed her in. I didn't kill her, the guy in my story did, but still, I wrote her into the story. She sauntered over, hips swing back and forth, just like in my story. She crawled into the truck bed with me and then put her hands on my shoulders. Her lips touched mine, and she kissed me deeply. I was totally losing my mind. This couldn't really be happening. I stopped kissing her, aroused by her wet lips, then pushed her away. She laughed. You're not real, I shouted. I'm as real as you made me, and as you killed me, she said as she backed away in motion toward the gash in her dress. I did kill her, not for real, but in a story. Or was it a story? I couldn't remember. Was it one of those nights partying so long ago while writing a story? Did I write about someone who was really killed? Or was it in a dream? You, you're not real, I blurted out through tears and snot. You, you were just a story. She laughed, and as she did, she and her daughter faded into the night. This was the last story I have ever written until now. I have nightmares. I don't know if she was real or just a story. If anyone knows Julie, it wasn't me. I swear it. One night, I was out partying with my friends in the woods. We did this often back then. I was 20 when this specific event happened, and I haven't been back. It was getting dark, and we were all drinking. I had to take a piss, so I wandered off by myself. While I am relieving myself over this bridge into a stream, I know that was a jackass move, but I was young, drunk, and stupid. I saw this dark shadow walking over the bridge toward me. <laughs> hey, what's up? I asked, but he just ignored me and walked on by. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman because of how the person was dressed. It looked like they had a hoodie on, but he also looked like a shadow of a person. He was carrying some kind of butcher knife, and it looked really bloody. It was really weird. Again, I was pretty smashed, and I could have just imagined it. I went back to my friends and told them about this crazy shadow, and they looked at me like I was crazy. You didn't know about Tyler Jones? One of my friends asked me. Um, no. Who the hell's Tyler Jones? Then, my friend, in all of his excitement, 
told me about Tyler Jones. He's an urban legend around here, man. We've all been waiting to see him. He's the kid that killed everyone in his family, including the dog. He went on some kind of psycho rampage when his mom took his video games away. After playing for 72 hours straight with no sleep, and all he did was drink coffee and drink soda the entire time while pissing in empty soda bottles. He was ready to win a battle with his friends right when she pulled the plug. And that's when he went nuts. Then, after he killed everyone, he went and jumped off that little bridge over the icy water where you were just pissing into. It was 17 below outside. And when he jumped, they say he went under the ice and it carried him downstream to a lake where they found him under the ice after the water began thawing. He was wearing a black hoodie and carrying that big knife you described. It was still frozen in his hands. You can say that after that, I never went back to that bridge again. I looked up the urban legend and it was mostly true there was some guy named Tyler Jones who had killed his family and jumped off the bridge. But they never found his body. That's just part of the rumor and the urban legend. People claim to have seen him all of the time, but usually it's just some jogger or it was made up just for attention. As for me, I will always wonder, did I see the ghost of Tyler Jones that night? I guess I will never know. One night, my friend and I went to the park near the woods. We had been going there for years, from the time that we were little kids on the swings, and then our early teens doing stuff we shouldn't be doing and would get into big trouble if we did them at home. We went there a lot because we were kind of brats. This time, we didn't get a chance to light up because when I was looking for my lighter, I thought I heard something rustling in the bushes. Now, the bushes are near this ditch that was supposed to be for a new sewage system that they've never put in. It fills with water when it rains and doesn't drain until summer. It's really gross and a total danger, but the city just refused to keep working on it. In the summer, people tend to live in it, but in the winter, when it rains a lot and sometimes freezes, they go under the highway. Anyway, when my friend and I were talking and I finally found my lighter, we were starting to smoke the pack of cigarettes I stole from my dad, and I noticed something in the ditch. It was drizzling, and had been raining earlier, so it was full of gross, mucky water. It was dark, but I know what I saw. There was a hand that shot out of the muddy water, and it grabbed the side. At this point, I couldn't speak. My friend was still talking and looking over the other direction, but I was so shocked and scared that I didn't even tell her to shut up for a minute. The first hand grabbed the edge, and then the second hand came up and pulled this really dirty-looking man who was completely naked out of the filth and grime of the ditch. I don't know how he was in there in the first place because it was covered in water. As he pulled himself up, he looked at me with an almost toothless grin and smiled. I thought he was some weird homeless guy that might have been stuck, but then we heard this gross crackling noise, and as it filled our ears, his body stretched into what looked like a dog. My friend still didn't see this, and she just heard it. I think she was trying to look from the other side where the sound might have been coming from. He looked at me with those yellow eyes and grinned this horrible smile that now 
had long, sharp teeth and drool coming from his mouth. A long, forked tongue snake-like from his lips and looked up at his eyeball. And then he ran off so fast that I finally let out a breath as my friend looked over at me. She asked me what happened because all the color had been drained from my face and I looked like I was about to pass out, is what she told me. When I explained, she just laughed and said it was probably the smoke clouding my head, except I reminded her that we haven't even lit up yet. After that day, I stopped smoking and never went to the creepy old park again. Sometimes I hear stories about kids who end up missing from that area. I want to say something, but I'm just too scared he'll find me since I know what he looks like and where he lives. Or I mean, guess he lives there. I once went hunting with my dad. It was my first time, and instead of hunting, he spent the whole day looking for me. I had gotten lost. He told me to stay on the trail, but I got curious about this weird-looking dog that I followed into the woods. Dad said when he came back to the place where he left me that I was gone, and he searched for about half an hour until he called the ranger and a few friends. It seemed they were out all day looking for me when I was right here all along. But right here isn't really where I thought it was. Right here is nowhere to be found. Let me explain. When I took off looking for the dog, I found an old cabin in the clearing. I thought maybe the dog went into that clearing. When I got there, the clearing had this really strange vibe to it. It was like if I walked into a whole different world. This air was different somehow. At the time, I attributed this to the sun being in the clearing and not the woods, but as the story gets stranger, you'll see why I thought differently later. Before, while in the woods, I heard birds and crickets. I could hear the frogs near the stream. Here I couldn't hear anything. It was like being inside of a vacuum. The sound was dull and the air felt stale. It had a taste to it that made me think of cardboard. Curious, I went to the house. All of the doors and windows were closed and boarded up. I knocked a few times, but when there was no answer, I was stupid enough to go inside anyway. You know, like when you yell at the person on TV to not enter the house in the woods. Well, I was that guy entering the house in the woods. When I entered, it smelled dead inside. It smelled old and musty and a bit rotten. It also smelled like a butcher shop. I don't know if you've been in the back of a butcher shop before, but I have. And meat has a smell to it when it is raw. That, if you're not used to it, it can make you feel ill if it's too much meat. And this meat? It wasn't all that fresh smelling either. Knowing this, stupid me goes back to what looked like the kitchen anyway. And that's when I saw him. This big guy who was probably six foot five and really huge carrying a giant cleaver was staring at me from the table. He was sawing into what looked like a pig skin with a hacksaw when he smiled. He slammed down the hacksaw and kept the cleaver in his other hand, swinging it toward me. I ran. I ran so fast that I went right out that door and back into the woods. When I turned around, the clearing was gone. There was no house. There was no clearing. Thank God there was no crazy man swinging a cleaver. I ran right into my dad, and he was like, Where did you come from? 
You weren't here a second ago. I tried to explain to him, but he thought I was making everything up for attention. He told me that the butcher, who lived in the old cottage in the middle of the forest, was hung a long time ago, and his cabin was torn down. A little sanctuary of trees was put in its place to honor the lives lost and buried on his land. I know what I saw, and I'm never going back there ever again. I used to board my horse in this little town called Heldsburg, north of where I grew up. They had this huge amount of land with riding trails in the mountains and all kinds of fun. One year, I was riding. My horse stopped walking and would not continue. Now, this mare was spooked by everything, so it wasn't uncommon for this to happen. I coaxed her to walk a little further until we noticed what was bugging her. I should have figured it was something dead. She hated dead things and could smell them a mile away. This time was different, though. Right in the middle of the trail were parts of a deer, particularly the skull and backbone. Everything else had been stripped away by whatever animals had been there before. It was just lying in the middle of the trail, like someone had put it there. The trail was small, and there was a cliff with trees on one side, and on the other was the side of a hill. I don't have to tell you she didn't want to walk around it or over it. She just stood there with her nostrils flaring and doing a small dance in place. Then I found out what she was really scared of. Out of nowhere, a man-sized wolf jumps out of the bushes behind us. At this point, she wasn't concerned about the bones. She hightailed it so fast down the trail, I swear I thought we were going to fall over the side and die. Fortunately, she was a very sure-footed animal, and we rode the rest of the trail with my girl looking from the side to side, sweating all the way home. I sometimes question how the bones were placed. It wasn't like an animal just left it there after killing and eating the deer. It was strategically put there, so whatever was crossing would be apprehensive and stop. Plus, I told the people who owned the place about the dead deer. The next day, he said he went out to find it, but there was nothing out there except for the frantic hoof prints my horse left and something that puzzled him. Next to the hoof prints were prints made by a barefoot human. It almost felt like a dream. I woke up to my dog Lucy barking. She was upright on the bed when my husband and I were sleeping with our 22-month-old daughter staring at our door like an unknown stranger was out there rummaging around. I thought she was just freaking out over the house noise. We only had her for three months and she was still a puppy. It could have just been anything our roommate, a creek from the house settling, the awnings moving outside in the breeze. I wasn't too concerned initially. I decided the best bet would be to open the door and show her nothing was there. It sounds a bit silly, but it's what we do with our daughter when she gets scared, and I figured it would work with a puppy too. I opened the door, and she raced to the front door. She stood there, snarling at the door. It was an angry, violent growl, one I had never heard her make before. I looked groggily at her and opened the baby gate, blocking the doorway, planning to open the door and show her everything was okay. The second my hand reached for the deadbolt, Lucy went wild. She started barking and jumped towards me, and when I touched the metal... 
She suddenly changed her temper. She whimpered, almost like she was afraid and backing down. As her mannerism changed, so did mine. I wasn't calm anymore. My heart was racing and sinking at the same time. I had been flooded with a mixture of fear and dread. I looked through the peephole. I can't explain why I looked, but I did. Outside were two kids. One was just a smidgen shorter than the other and didn't look much younger. I'm 21 and she looked to be about 16 or 17. She was slender and pale. Her hair was a light shade of honey blonde and she wore it long, about mid back with long, thin, blunt bangs in the front that covered most of her eyes. She wore jeans, a light wash that's popular right now, and a thin-looking, olive-colored pullover-style hoodie. She held the hand of a small girl, who looked to be around three or four, in the same style jeans and a button-down ivory cardigan. The smaller one looked at the floor shyly, but had the same shade of hair, tied back in a ponytail. She had a stuffed toy under her free arm, and it was identical to one my daughter has, as was their style of dress. Had it not been for the feeling of overwhelming dread and fear, I probably would have asked these children in and given them some tea or hot chocolate to get them out of the bitter cold. Something about them just seemed off. At this point, I hadn't made any noise. I hadn't shushed the dog or grumbled. Nothing. I hadn't turned on the lights. These kids had no indicators. I was at the door. The older one spoke. She had a voice that was mature, confident, strong, and accentless. She held her head tilted downward, and I couldn't see her eyes. She said, we have to use your phone. I stood frozen in fear. How did she know I was there? She raised her head to face me directly, and that was when I saw her eyes. There was a reason I couldn't see them through the bangs before. They were black, or midnight blue, or a dark, dark purple. They were otherworldly. She said... Our mother is worried. As someone who has always been interested in creepy stories, I knew what she was the second she looked at me through the door. I have never been one to believe in these things, as a staunch atheist and skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. I had written off many a ghost story from friends and family members eager to tell their tale. I still didn't believe it. Still, I couldn't rationalize my way out of this. I was standing with nothing but a thin wooden door between me and a black-eyed kid. There was no questioning what was right in front of me. I did not answer her. Slowly and silently, I backed away from the door. Lucy still carrying at my ankles. She kept talking. Just let us use your phone. I took another step back, and with that step, the tone changed. At first, she seemed polite. When I took that second step back, she became commanding, almost hostile. We're not going to hurt you. If we wanted to do that, we would have broken in. I'll ask again. May we come in and use your phone? Lucy snarled at the door, and I inched backward, though something inside me seemed to be slowly pulling me back toward the door. It wasn't a physical pulling so much as a subconscious need to go back and let them in. I got to my room, covered up the window, locked the door, and sat there in the dim light of the nightlight. I heard her call me back to the door once more, and then quiet. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I haven't slept right since then. 
I know from reading about them that black-eyed kids can't just come in without permission. I know they haven't hurt anyone, but I still fear I'll be the exception. When I told my husband, he said it was just a dream. He keeps telling me to forget it, but this lingering feeling of sadness, this dread when the house is silent at night, this fear of a knock at the door, this tells me otherwise. I will never go camping again. Last weekend, we went camping. We weren't supposed to because everyone in the world has this SIP going on. If you're reading this in the future, SIP means stay in place because the world is deathly afraid of getting this coronavirus thing that has released somehow in China. Some people think a chick ate a bat that had it and others think that it was a biological weapon released by the Chinese. All I know is that it's like a Stephen King novel and it's severely disrupting life as we know it. Most businesses are shut down and people can only really buy groceries or stuff for the necessity of life. We're allowed to take walks, but we're supposed to stay six feet away from each other. Even the grocery store aisles have one-way only traffic. In our local store, we have to wear masks to keep other people from getting sick, just in case we are sick. They are also only allowing so many people in at a time. So, here we are at this campground. There are only a few others around in their campsites. Usually, it's packed at this time of year, so it's pretty nice. There are no noisy kids around, and those adults who are here are trying to be quiet so people don't complain about campers. It is the last day of the Memorial Day weekend, and everyone else has gone home but us. I suppose some of them still have jobs. We don't. We both lost our jobs due to the stupid mess. I don't see why they can't let office people work, but they can still let the cesspool at Walmart work, and people go in and out of that store. It's nuts. Anyway, as I said, we're going home today, and I'm glad. Last night, while we were sitting out by the fire, we heard something in the bushes, Thinking it was possibly a rabbit or raccoon waiting for us to leave some food out, we just dismissed it. Then, a few minutes later, some crazy guy with a huge knife and his mouth bleeding everywhere came barreling out of the bushes. He's yelling and screaming about the world coming to an end. He obviously had been there for days because he was all dirty, as were his clothes. But he's yelling and screaming. He comes after me first, but my husband is a third-degree black belt with a previous career as a Marine. Gets up and knocks this guy down before he even got to me. As he is being held down, my husband is trying to not get close to this guy's face because we don't know if he's rabid, has COVID-19, on drugs, or is just literally, clearly insane. I grab the rope and tie him the best that I could so my husband can do the rest. Then the unthinkable happened. As we prop this guy up near the tree, he spits on our faces. My husband punches him in his face, but the guy is still laughing at us. It's then I see that all of his teeth have been pulled and he's bleeding through fresh sockets in his gums. We wiped off the blood and sterilized what we could. The sheriff came and took him away and told us that we'd better just pack up and go home before we get into trouble for being out. We showered in the RV and spent one last night under the stars and 
shook up beyond all hell. Now, we have to wait 14 days to see if we're sick, or if he was sick. That is the biggest nightmare of the entire whole event. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true esoteric stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes and the gifted memberships. Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S., Tina Mead, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugared Spite, Mrs. Innerscare, and Anita B., Thank you all for remaining the pillars on which Back to Ashes stands. I can't thank or love you enough for it. Our gifted memberships. The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Grigg, Nat Davies, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much and I hope you've been enjoying your time here on the channel. To all the subscribers and or listeners, thank you all so much for supporting Back to Ashes, because without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.